Hello everyone, this is Ben, and in today's not-so-planned video, we're going to talk about where Christianity meets politics, and the sort of the culture war that goes on today uh, with Christianity seems to largely revolve around sexuality. Uh, the issue is that Christians, and you know, regardless of what the Bible says, in the churches and what Christians say and what Christian you know basic teaching and doctrine is is that sex is between one man and one woman for life and so people have a problem with that people contest that they fight that and so Christians are seen as you know basically it's a no-win situation for Christians so like on the one end you're seen as judgmental and someone who thinks you're like better than everybody else or you know someone who maybe just has really silly outdated rules that are just completely arbitrary and pointless and you know they're no different from you know maybe just silly superstitions and no one should have to put up with them and then they you know people say that you know this causes psychological damage because, you know, you feel guilty for, for just your natural sexual desires and that sort of thing. Um, and, and then, you know, so like in, in some cases of, of homosexuals, they would say, or, or someone who's transgender, they would say that, you know, Christianity teaches things that actually hurt these people. You know, uh, homosexuals feel very unaccepted in their society. You know, it's all Christians' fault. Because Christians teach that homosexuality is a sin. And then, you know, transgenders uh, have this really high suicide rate and all this. And, you know, so there's that. Then on the other end, let's say that you're a Christian, but you don't, you, you don't seem to think that all of those sexual rules are important. Well, in that case, you're a hypocrite because you don't actually practice what you preach. Okay, that's that's the way people are going to see you then. And then on the other end, Christians are seen, you know, as being too strict. So, like, there's this fear that there's a sort of Christian right-wing conservative agenda to, you know, ban homosexuality, uh, ban people, uh, tra uh, you know, transgender activity, I guess. Um, you know, tr tr the 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 transition, that's what I mean, At, or like uh, you know, and, and or, or just any form of sodomy, you know, banning you know actual legal penalties for you know sodomy and that sort of thing. You know, you've got the Roman Catholic Church that uh, I think they consider. Uh, the use of condoms and birth control a sin uh, or something like that. You know, even if they don't, it is kind of uh, more of a thing in the past. You know, and of course in the past it was things were different because we didn't have uh, effective condoms and effective birth control. So, like, a lot of that stuff is, you know, a new issue in general. So, let's just take a look at it. But let's just take a look at the criticisms that are leveled against Christianity and and do what we do, do Christian apologetics and defend Christianity. So I guess one of the first and, and most simple criticisms is mockery. There's just a mockery of Christians as being out of date and we need to get with the times. You know, this religion you teach is this Bronze Age nonsense. And, and it's it's ancient and it's archaic and it's just silly all right so the uh, the issue there is uh, you need to learn your history so the idea of sex being only properly done in a monogamous relationship between a man and a wife that idea is the new idea. It's not the old idea. And so, one of the easier ways to do this is to take a look at 
uh, what the Bible talks about. And, you know, this isn't, it's not in any way, if I remember right, I heard this in, uh, I can't remember where I heard this, but in other lecture courses, every culture in the world was, in the ancient world, when, when the Bible emerged, when the Old Testament was first, and you had the, the Hebrews back in Israel, every culture was completely accepting of homosexuality. Not necessarily encouraging of it, that, I think that was unique to the Greeks. I mean, so in the Greeks' case, Plato said that if you desired women sexually more than men, then you were like a, basically an untrustworthy person. And uh, especially in your love relationships, you were an adulterous person. And uh, this even went for, as Plato put it, this even went for the women. If women were more ha, ha, were lesbians, or they had more of a desire for women than for men, then there was something wrong with them. And if men had more of a desire for women, so it was just basically misogynistic. It was just you know, in other words, anti-women, which was part. You know, we can't we want to go into it too much because uh, let's let's take a look at this Leviticus eighteen. All right, and really the best way to to uh, do Leviticus 18 is to just read all of Leviticus 18. It's not that long. And so this is Leviticus 18 in the, King, in the ESV version. So this is the Old Testament law. This is written in the, a long time ago. In, not in the, well, basically late Bronze Age, early Iron Age transition period. Okay, so I'm being more specific than just saying in the Bronze Age. <laughs> okay, so it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You, you shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived, and you shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach any one of his close relatives to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. All right, so already, right there, we've got this, you know, don't be looking at your close relatives naked, you know, incest, no. But understand that these are practices that were going on uh in the surrounding region. So he's going to list out, he says, you know, don't do as they do in Egypt and don't do as they do in the land of Canaan. And then he gives his rules and then that's his first rule. Don't look at your close relatives to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. He's going to make it more clear. So let's just read away. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister. It is your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether brought up in the family or in another home. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, for their nakedness is your own nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. So I think y'all by this point can figure out what uncover the nakedness means. So he's, you know, he's going through everyone. Your father's sister, no. Your mother's sister, no. Your father's brother, no. It says, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. That is, you shall not approach his wife. She is your aunt. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Your brother's wife. The nakedness of a woman and of her daughter. No. It is depravity, as he says. You shall not take a woman as a rival wife to her sister, uncovering her nakedness while her sister is still alive. You shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual uncleanness. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children... Listen to this. Now, let's just think about this. If all of this stuff is going on in the people around the Israelites, because he says, don't do anything they do, instead do what I do. And then he gives his rules. So, in other words, 
that's the stuff they do. Now, if they're having, they're having a lot of sex, if they're having like sex in every which way, okay, what do you think is going to be the result of that? A lot of unwanted children. And so look at the next command after all of these people, you're not, these, basically all these women you're not supposed to have sex with. He says, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech, and so profane the name of your Lord your God, of your God, I am the Lord. In other words, that the Moloch is like it's like a bronze god. I think it's Baal, and I think if I understand correctly, it's a little bit difficult to understand. But I think the Moloch is the way in which you worship Baal. It's a bronze altar with bronze hands with a fire under it, and you lay your infant on the bronze hands, and it it kills it. And uh, so they do this at night. And they beat drums, and, and the Greeks and the Romans certainly did not do this. And uh, they actually talk a lot about the people who did do this, who lived right next door to the Israelites. But uh, it's another story for another time. And, you know, the, the drama between the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians and the Greeks and the Romans. Okay, so anyway, you, so you don't offer them to Moloch. All right, verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. So homosexuality right there. And you shall not lie with any animal, and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things. For by all these, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean. So in other words, he makes it quite clear Every single thing he's li he's listed there, multiple, you know, taking your wife, your your wife's sister as a rival wife, your daughter-in-law, you know, everything, you know, homosexuality with animals, you know, the unwanted children, your neighbor's wife. Okay, he says that. Every one of those things is what the Canaanites are doing, the people that he's driving out before them. And he says, And the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations. Either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you, for the people of the land who were before you did all of these abominations, so that the land became unclean. Let the land vomit you out when when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For anyone, for everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who do them shall be cut off from among the people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you, and never to make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. So right there, let's that's that's kind of the first thing we want to point out is that in the larger picture. Monogamy is new. In if you look at time and you go from like, you know, the 1950s to today, you would say that monogamy is the old way and then promiscuity is the new way. But promiscuity promiscuity is actually older. It's much older because you got to understand the Jewish nation essentially was sort of an island of being a chosen people to God, set apart to God, that were unique and different from people around them. You know, Greece could continue to exist, Egypt continued to exist, Babylon continued to exist, and, you know, so that gives you an idea of what was going on. Eventually, the Alexander the Great conquered Persia, and when he did, he also conquered Israel. Because by, at that point, Israel was part of Persia. And Israel had been conquered by Babylon, but then, and they, they did not get along with Babylon, and they were sent off in, into exile as slaves. And uh, the Persians conquered Babylon, and they made things much nicer for the Israelites, let them go back, have their cities, have their little sort of local government. I think you had to, like, basically pay a lot of money to the Persian emperor. And then... Uh, the Persians were conquered by the Greeks. And so the Greeks and the 
the the Jews, I guess we'll call them. I want to say Israelites. I don't want to say Israelites or Jews at this point. The the Greeks and the Jews didn't get along, and there eventually was a revolt. And uh, for a little while, the Jews were their own independent state under the Maccabean. I think it's the Maccabean revolt. Revolt, and that's what Hanukkah celebrates and stuff. So like, uh, it was over just being forced to follow Greek religion and religious practices. But during that time, you get a lot of evangelism. Uh, in that terminology, they'd say proselytization, because that was the word that was used. You would The Jews went out and basically converted, and they were effective at converting people to becoming Jews. But part of the difficulty that the Jews ran into in converting Greeks into becoming Jews was that you had to get circumcised and follow all of these. You had to become ethnically Jewish, and you've got to marry other Jews, and you've got to follow kosher laws and all that. And and uh, when Paul comes along and starts spreading Christianity, his thing is like, you don't have to get circumcised. There are things you have to do, but you don't have to become a Jew to be a Christian. You can be a Gentile Christian. And so... Uh, Christianity is able to convert a lot more, and it probably has to do with the fact that monotheism in general tends to be a religion of greater value, because you're talking about a god of greater scope, power, significance, and it has it demands greater devotion, and so it just it just obviously it wins out. In, in the battle of ideas as like an idea that if it's true it clearly is more valuable kind of thing whereas the polytheistic gods that they you know the issue is is that before the Greeks had multiple gods but none of those gods were really consequential enough you know to ever an answer life's big questions like why are we here what's it all about you know they were kind of bickering and fighting back and forth and they were just more like they were more like DC Comics and Marvel Comics, like superheroes. Like they weren't, they weren't supreme beings. And the Greeks had already abandoned that as their ultimate religion, and the philosophical schools had already embraced, you know, monotheism. But it was like all over the place in its beliefs about God, and so that's where Christianity came in and brought in a belief about God that sort of settled the debate and made sense. But the point I'm making to you is that by the time of Jesus, there were a million Jews living in Judea, the Roman province of Judea. But there were about six million living in the diaspora to the point that the Bible had, in I think in 200 B.C., been translated into Greek because Jews couldn't read Hebrew anymore. They needed a Greek Bible. They were taking Greek names. And so you get the idea that, like, this gives you a sense of how the, you know, in other words, if monogamy is not something that was present around Israel, when did it start spreading? It started spreading about the time of Alexander the Great. And the Jew, the Jewish diaspora started. And they started really converting people. And then the, the ramping up of, of, uh, conversion of the, you know, of the Gentiles, I guess really began uh, when Christianity comes along. But even then, the cultural shift took time. Christianity didn't really just eliminate paganism overnight. And so, if you fast forward to 700 AD, then you get to Charlemagne, he had seven wives. And the Catholic Church was still working to spread Christian doctrines on monogamy, even at that point. And so, it wasn't too long after that, I think, that the Catholic Church was able to institute the sacrament of marriage. And basically, it meant that, like, if your marriage count was to count in God's eyes, then you had to be married by the church. And so then the church would say, you only get one wife. So people would have, you know, sort of side wives, but once they had one legal wife, that kind of sort of put the worm in the wood for bringing about real cultural change. There were there were still a lot of issues even by that far into the the early Middle Ages 
where people were Christians, but they still hadn't changed their sexual views. So one of the issues that was going on in Charlemagne's day was this thing, um, one night marriages, because uh, the way marriage worked back then is you weren't married by the church, you and it didn't have anything to do with the government, um, and it didn't even have it. It wasn't even like any an agreement between families. The agreement between families was how things worked. Things worked in the Middle East and where Jesus was from. It was a, more of an agreement between families, but the Christianity had spread to. I guess the um, these medieval uh, the people the Romans called barbarians these Germanic uh, tribes and their culture was much more independent. You leave a tribe and join a new tribe, and this it's a big influence on just being white today. Is is like you don't just stay with your tribe and your family and your extended second cousins and all that. You when you get married you separate off and that's your little nuclear family. That's that's how they lived, and that's that's a, a key component of their identity. And so the way that they got married is like literally you'd be in a bar and you'd see the girl and you'd say, "Hey, will you marry me?" And she'd say, "Yeah." And then you have sex that night because you're married, because now you're married. Like that was it was just literally just an agreement between the man and the woman. That was it. And the problem they had in that day was like men would you know say that. And then the woman would wake up and the man would be gone. So the Catholic Church, that was one of the reasons they instituted the sacra sacrament of marriage. And, and, you know, essentially, you know, I don't know how they word it, but basically God told us to do this. This is like communion, taking the Lord's Supper and baptism. Marriage is also, a, you know, a divinely inspired uh, ceremony that must be performed by the proper authority handed down from Peter through to to the proper God's holy church you know and so you got to be married by the priest and it also had political ramifications because the uh, that meant that like if your wife wasn't the correct wife by which you had the child then that child could not become your your successor as king and so Whereas before, it wasn't handled, and the church didn't have so much say-so in it. Through the sacrament of marriage, the church started having, by, by the year 1000, the church was having a lot of say-so in, the, in these matters. And so things had really shifted from the 700s to, you know, 300 years later. So, that gives you a kind of a feel for the transition. And so, the important point I want to make to you is, like, if you go before... Israel's on the scene and you go to the nations that were that surrounded them Egypt Babylon uh, Greece of course oh it's it's Amy or Ewing she's a Christian apologist at the, I think she's at the Oxford Center for Christian Apologetics and at, at RZIM and she's a British lady she's the one who was talking about the homosexuality thing so uh, there's that she's the one tell yeah that's where I heard that that like all of those cultures were accepting a homosexuality and certainly the Bible is talking about this with the the Canaanites uh, with the Greeks it's very well known um, uh, love I think it was Aristotle who said that like love between men is the highest form of love because it's love between equals uh, in Sparta the gay relationship was typically someone who was you know your peer in age uh, so, like, for example, in Sparta, this is how their weddings worked. They had a unique wedding ceremony. Um, the Spartans conquered a neighboring city-state called the Messenians, and the Messenians outnumbered them ten to one. And so the Spartans realized that if we want to... So when, when I say conquer, I mean they enslaved them. They conquered them, and they, then they made them their slaves. And the Spartans were like, we don't have to work anymore because these people, we just, you know... They do everything for us. Okay, but if they outnumber them 10 to 1, it's unlikely that the Spartans will be able to maintain military dominance. So they, the way, one of the ways they maintain military dominance is they invented the phalanx, which is a key component of Western military dominance even to this day. And why, you know, so like, essentially in, in, in uh, battle, 
two, whoever outnumbers the other side is going to win. But two battle lines and two groups of people are never going to form two perfectly flat lines that collide with each other perfectly evenly. The lines are going to be bumpy. Some people are going to be ahead. Some people are going to be back. So the Spartans came up with the idea of like, okay, at the points of contact, maybe we can just outnumber the other side there, and then we'll be able to defeat the other side with, with even though they have greater numbers. And so the, the example, of course, is with the Messenians. Uh, they outnumber the Spartans 10 to 1. The Spartans also worked a lot in training and, you know, essentially assassinating people in the night. That was a big part, in, of, and it leads to their wedding ceremony. So, like, a Spartan boy would stay with his mother, I think, until six or eight years old. And then uh, the, all Spartan boys had to serve in the military. And so, be separated from his mother and put with the other boys his age. And that's, so he's going to go through puberty, high school, middle school, you know, all that in his 20s, spending all of his time around uh, other boys his age. And so they, and they, of course, like all the other Greek societies, valued the gay relationship. And uh, you would get assigned a wife after you were an actual soldier. So to become a soldier, the training was pretty tough. One of the things they did was like they wouldn't give you enough food so that you would have to fight for your food. You had to, like, beat people up. There was the only way you could, you know, just to force them to fight. Um, the uh, the Spartan, you trained the Spartan phalanx. So, in other words, the Spartan phalanx was, like, instead of using slinging weapons like the, the other people did, like swords and axes and stuff, they used spears because spears, you can stand close to one another. And you have a shield, I have a shield and a little spear, and we can we can outnumber them at the point of contact. So... The Spartan wedding is like once you were a after age 20 and you were assigned your squad, you would be assigned a wife and, and was a decision, I think, made by your the, the families, uh, if I understand right. You were assigned a wife and you were to, you had to sneak out of your barracks at night and sneak out of the military camp. And if anyone saw you, then you it was like a failed marriage, I guess. Um, but your job was to sneak out, and you had to sneak into your wife's bedroom. And without anyone seeing anything, and have sex with her, and then sneak all the way back. And it had to do with that whole, they, they had to assassinate a lot of Messenians. So, like, that's how the Spartans got married. That's the Spartan marriage ceremony. Um, and then you go back to your to your squad. I think in Athens, what's, what they did in Athens is kind of famous. So, like, 50-year-old men who had already raised their children would go to parties with middle school boys, and they would mingle. And if you were lucky, one of the the better older men would come to your house later and select you. And then you, so in middle school, it was important to go through this time where you would spend two years in the woods with the 50-year-old man. And there's some debate about it now, but I think the old, there's a word for the man and a word for the boy, and people thought it translated to penetrated and penetrator. And the, the older man would be the penetrator, and the younger boy would be the penetrated. Um, and you spend two years in the woods learning the ways of manhood. So, hopefully, and I gave a lot of history there. That was a lot of history, but it's kind of the only way to, to kind of give the sense of, you know, our modern concept of, of monogamy is actually the new kid on the block. It's not, it's not yesterday's news. It's, it's actually progressive in the big scheme of things. Because, you know, if Ab I mean, like Moses and the, the, the beginning of the Old Testament in the time of Moses would have been a thousand years after the building of the, of the Great Pyramids. 
in about 2600 BC. So, you know, and then it's, it's a long time before we actually get to where monogamy is the norm in, in, in 1000 AD, in, in just in Western Europe, too. So that gives you an idea. All right, now, so there's that. Now, I guess another issue is, uh, I guess we'll go with the Obama thing. So as I understand it, Barack Obama opposed gay marriage and he didn't want it legalized, and he wanted uh, us to just have civil unions and just keep things, you know, status quo. But then uh, this court case happened, I think, in 2015, and uh, homosexual marriage was legalized. And so he kind of jumped on board all of a sudden, and he tweeted out, if I remember right, love wins. So that that's a good intro to the, this next issue is if people say that like <coughs> Christians are essentially as Christians we are opposed to homosexual marriage then we're opposed to men loving other men that's kind of the argument that people make now the flaw there is that well for one uh the book of 1 John says that like if you don't love your brother who you can see then there's no way you can love God who you cannot see. And so, I mean, that's pretty serious. Like, that's saying that, like, you don't even love God at all if you don't love your brother. So we, and then in the previous chapter in 1 John 3, he says, this is love, that you lay down your life for your brother. And so that's really to the point. We're supposed to have the highest form of love possible for, you know, as one man to another, as one woman to another woman, you know, for everyone as Christians. And so the problem is, is that I guess Obama's representing our modern culture's idea that the highest form of love is to have sex with a person. But the Christian concept, according to First John, the highest form of love is to lay down your life for another person. And that, that's, that's really kind of the issue is like, is sex the highest form of love? Well, in a sense, it's like you're consenting to give someone rights to your body, and that is very significant. And that's, that's a very, very... That's no low form of love as long as it's done, you know, if, with, with, as long as you're really consenting, you know, it's, it's not like rape or something. But like, the issue is, uh, you're still enjoying it because the other person is giving you rights too. So it's sort of a shared thing. Whereas, if you're making a sacrifice like Jesus did, that doesn't benefit Jesus at all to be crucified for our sins. So, According to 1 John 3.16, the highest form of love is, is modeled with Christ on the cross. Christ didn't come to have sex with us. He came to do, go even further for us. You know, you were talking about going all the way. That's going further than all the way. Jesus Christ went to the point of where it didn't benefit him. It benefited us. That's a Christian concept of love. So, one, uh, one way, one, uh, like, sort of way I try to help people sort of think this through, you know, is I have to, do, I have to explain it sometimes to, to teenagers a lot. And this is a big one for teenagers. They don't get why we should, why they can't just have sex, whoever, however, whenever. Um, so, I tell them that uh, it's simple. A father and son aren't going to have sex with one another, but that doesn't mean that they don't love one another. It's just that sex is not the proper way for them to express that love, the love that they have. There are other more appropriate ways. That sex is, exists for a special purpose, and to it, it's more about the a way of expressing things. 
You know, so if a father and son have sex with one another, we would say that that's not the appropriate way for the two of them to to uh, express the fact that they love one another. But it doesn't mean at all that they don't love one another. And as long as we have a culture that's real, really, really concerned about rape and that kind of thing, and we recognize that a child can't really consent because they don't really understand what they're getting into, then we recognize that, like, okay, all right. Now, the rape issue is interesting because it seems to be front and center in our culture all the time today that rape is bad, rape is bad, rape is bad, rape is bad. And that, you know, we get this from the left a lot. They're like, you know, the world doesn't recognize how bad rape is and needs to be told over and over and over again that rape is really bad. So from a Christian perspective, it's kind of weird because, like, on the one out of the one side of their mouth they want to say that like sex is no big deal and just you know it's no it's not it's not sacred but on the other side of their mouth it's like it's a really big deal it you know because I mean all you're doing is just you know feeling someone else's body what's the big deal well there's something to that right that's must be a, some sort of sacred of our violation of that which is sacred so that's something to think about there. I mean, why is rape a big deal? You could go through that and just ask people, why do you think rape is a big deal? And I don't see how you could really follow that rabbit trail and not come to the conclusion that sex is sacred. And if sex is sacred, then you have to start asking big questions. Like, why is sex sacred? Why is it? Why is sex such a big deal? Because I me, mean, ultimately, you know, if I touch this table, it's not sex. Or I'll put it to you this way: in really, really graphic terms, you know, this is really graphic. When a child is born, his or her entire body passes through the birth canal of the mother. This could not be a bigger, there could not be more physical contact with the sexual parts of this woman's body, of the mother's body. You know, the child's entire body passes through that thing. And we say, okay, is that sex? No. Why is it not sex? Well, because they aren't, it's, it's about the mental state with which they're doing it. So if I simply make contact with someone's sexual organs, but I don't intend to, that's not sex. Sex is fundamentally in the mind. And so it's, it's an idea that's associated with physical contact. And when that idea is, when you're taking that physical contact on the basis of that idea of sex because of sexual desires without consent then it's considered a, almost like murder of that person's life and so it's it's a, a person's sexual uh, rights are considered as sacred as their own life as valuable you know it's just it's it, there's no other way around it it's considered sacred like it's just something that cannot be violated because it's too it's too set apart from from the mundane as in the everyday the normal the ordinary so that's an important thing to understand like why why is this such a big deal well it comes back to this idea that like well sex must be sacred and so you know this is the question I get I had a question from teenage boy um, and then like a couple other teenage boys chimed in and they were on the same page and they wanted to know, they were like, why, why, uh, should they worry about having, you know, why, why can't, in other words, that this is what, this is the way the boy put it to me. He said that, you know, one day he'll get married and he'll be true to his wife. But before then, why can't he just have sex with different women? Okay, and I didn't want to put forward to him some slippery slope of like, well, if you go down that road, then you know, all of these bad things will happen, and and like scare him, 
That's not how I, because ultimately that's not what it's about. You know, that's the way a lot of times Christians argue. They say, well, if you do that, you might get AIDS or you might get someone pregnant that you don't want to get pregnant. Or you might feel, sex with your wife might feel less special because you didn't save yourself. Or, you know, or like, what if uh, that becomes a distraction? Like you get tied up with a girl just because of sex and then you don't want to break up with her because you enjoy the sex but really you know you, you don't have your head on straight and she, you're, you're not really compatible and then like you're too caught up in that and like you don't you you miss a good opportunity with a woman that you should marry you know or something like that all of that you know the problem with all of that is it's simply saying that like these bad consequences will happen to you if you don't obey God and the issue the problem I have with that is that like Jesus and the Bible and the apostles are very clear that bad consequences will happen to you for obeying God and that the consequences should not dictate your actions. Rather, your actions should be dictated by what's right. Peter and Paul were killed because they spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. The consequences of their actions did not dictate what the correct action was for them. Rather, they did what God wanted them to do. And so if I'm going to tell some young man what he should do, it's going to be because it's right, not because something else that he doesn't like will happen. I'm not going to go into this karma Christianity that, you know, that, that comes up all the time. And so, like, that's the thing. Now, so I had a hard time explaining it to him, and, and, and I had the same question from a, a different group of teenagers. And it was interesting because in both situations, I tried like two different ways of explaining it. And in one situation, one of the ways of explaining it flopped and the other one worked great. And then in the, and then I flipped the switch and I was in a different situation and like the, the, the like analogies for explaining it flip flop. So I'll just, I'll just give you both the analogies, whoever's out there and we'll see which one works for you. Okay. So. <coughs> <coughs> The first one is a, uh, it's a song by a band uh, called 238, and they're a Christian band, but they wouldn't be like, they're not like a praise and worship band necessarily, but uh, they didn't hide their Christianity either. They were openly Christian, and sometimes they would, you know, that's the, they would just sing songs about what was important to them, and Christianity would come out of that, you know, some of the time, a lot of the time, but like not all the time. Um, and so he's singing one song and it's called the bathroom is a creepy place. And it's about this guy who's like had, he, he's had, he's come to a girl's house and he says it's like three or four o'clock in the morning and I'm here in your bathroom shaving in your fifties tub with lady Remington. You know, he's giving all that he's setting the scene and he says, you've got me quite worked up tonight, you know, but I'm looking at your wall and there's like pictures of people I've never met and I'm sitting here wondering why they're staring at me now and he says the bathroom is a creepy place for pictures of your friends and like it's something to think about like if you go in some, if you were creeped out by going in someone's bathroom and taking a bath and seeing the pictures of their friends on the wall and you're like I don't know this person where am I and if you feel like you don't belong in her bathroom then maybe you don't belong in her vagina, you know, to put it in a blunt way. Like, why are you so comfortable with that, but not comfortable with the other thing? And the reason is because you don't have this biological need to use her bathroom. So when you're using her bathroom and you're shaving, and you feel like, hmm, I don't, I'm a stranger here, I don't know if I really should just come in here and treat it like it's my house, you know, I don't even know who these people are on the wall. I'm naked in her bathroom shaving, and this is making me uncomfortable. Well, then maybe you should have been uncomfortable having sex with her. Maybe you don't belong. <laughs> maybe you don't. You haven't established enough of a relationship, and so that that's kind of the point. And if you establish that point, then you you begin to say, okay, all right. Well, I think I see how this works. Um, <laughs> moving forward, how important 
how comfortable should you have to be before you can have sex with a person? How close is that to someone physically? It's pretty close. It's kind of hard to imagine being more close to someone physically. And so then it's a direct line from that simple concept of that song to sex should only be for marriage. Um, that worked with one group of kids. It didn't work with another. I could try a different analogy. Like, would you feel uncomfortable coming in someone's house, opening the fridge, and, like, drinking some of their milk, like, without asking? And, you know, putting your feet up on their coffee table and, like, knowing how things work in their house. Because, like, when I come to someone's house, I don't know. I'm not just going to go in there and just open the fridge and, like, just get a glass and start drinking their milk, you know, and just put my feet on their coffee table. You know, or like plop my shoes, like, like I'm going to treat it differently because it's their house. So like, again, it's the same concept. Like if you feel that way about their fridge and their milk, maybe you should feel that way about their body. Okay. <laughs> so like, that's kind of the idea. It's a way of thinking about it. Another, another way you could, you could express it is, uh, like this, um, with the other group of kids, I just asked them, I said, okay, let's just assume God exists. I'd already given them proof for God's existence, but we'll just start with God exists. God created men and women and everything. And, you know, God could have made us where we didn't have sex. And so, like, he could have made us where we, we didn't even have to have sex to have babies. He could have made us where we... We just spit eggs out our mouth like on Dragon Ball Z, like the like the Namics, where they don't have males and females. And they're like, they use photosynthesis to make food, and they just drink water. It's weird. Okay. But, like, we could have been asexual. Why are we, why are, why are we a gendered, you know, species? Why do we have males and females? What's up with that? Why did God make that? And so the kids will invariably say that, like, uh, so we can have babies. Or they might they might go a step further and so so babies can have mamas and daddies instead of just one parent, okay, and uh, the response is, mo humans and dolphins for that matter, have recreational sex. In other words, most of the sex humans have is not for making babies. It is how humans make babies, but most of the time that's not what you're doing. You're not making babies most of the time, okay. So like. What about 99% of the time when you're having sex? What is that? Why did God create that? Okay. And uh, usually they come to the conclusion that, like, it must be some sort of expression of deepest love between two people. If they just dig at that for, for two seconds, that's the conclusion they come to. So, I mean, there's that. Um, now, you could ask the question, like, you could dig a little deeper into that and, like, say, well, okay, I think I had one one girl one time, I wasn't sure exactly, but this seemed like her point of view, was that, like, okay, love is a good thing, all right, so why shouldn't I love a lot of people and have sex with a lot of people? Okay, that's, that seems fairly simple reasoning, and so one way to think through that is to simply... Go at it like this. It's pretty simple. Just say, all right, here we go. I am, hey, you, I love you. You're great. You're my friend. Bye. Hey, you, you're great. I love you. You're my friend. Bye. Hey, you, you're great. I love you. You're my friend. Bye. In other words, like, if you're going to try to, you know, have sex with a lot of people, love a lot of people, then, like, there's going to be a point of commitment that you're, you're never going to go beyond. And so you're not going to go deeper into love. You're, everyone's going to kind of have to share you and that sort of thing. And to some degree, that's impossible to escape in life. But the question is, what's the more valuable form of love? What's that deeper commitment form of love? That's a higher form of love. That should, even if you can't find it, even if you fail, you should still pursue it because it's more valuable. Even if you even if you try and try and try and fail and fail and fail, what else are you going to do with your life except pursue that which is good, that which is better?
What else do you want? What, 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 what are you going to trade? As Jesus would say, what would you trade for the kingdom of heaven? Even if you can't find the kingdom of heaven, like why would you, why would you pursue anything else? You know, so uh, the uh, that's the idea. And so, if you think, well, okay, what did God create sex for? Well, He created for that stronger form of love that you know we that deeper commitment. And you know, sex without commitment is sex without love. I mean. Because with no commitment, no commitment, no love, and so if there's, then then if there's no commitment between two people that are having sex, and there's no love. There has to be some commitment, some sort of commitment, even if it's a minor commitment. You know, it has to. You know, it's difficult to say. Well, you know, maybe you wouldn't marry the person, but you would at least you know love them to a point. You know, but if there's just absolutely no commitment to what's best for the other person, then there's no love for that person. Now, so there we go. Now, one of the interesting things people say is like, well, the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality. Now, of course, we looked at Leviticus 18, um, but it's a lot easier to put this in the terms uh, that Jesus puts it in, in Matthew 19. So this is a lot simpler. Jesus sort of issues a blanket statement about sex and sexual relationships and that sort of thing. And maybe this will be a good one to end on. Maybe so. So Matthew 19. All right. Uh, we'll go to the NIV on this one. Oh, sorry. It's Matthew 19.19. 19. We got to go to Matthew 19, the whole chapter. So one of the common things they say is Jesus never s said anything about homosexuality. Well, he didn't say anything about homosexuality explicitly. Rather, he issued a blanket statement that covers homosexuality and all of the other sexual things. You know, because it's either that or you go, you, I mean, look at the, all the things we went through in Leviticus 18. Like, wow. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of, there's a fetish for everything. And if Jesus is going to list out every exactly sexually wrong thing, it's going to be talking about a lot of things. So it's a lot easier for him to have this sort of blanket statement that he gives in Matthew 19, which is important on a lot of levels. So it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now it's important to understand that these are probably, these conversations that Jesus has, even these debates, it's probably not word for word exactly what the Pharisees said and what Jesus said. So, like, uh, one way you can see that is, like, well, in other words, they're not word for word. They're, they're probably summaries, you know, divinely inspired summaries of what the conversations that Jesus had, of what the Pharisees said, of what Jesus said, of what the people said, of what the apostles said. In some cases, I think in Luke, he'll say, and they were saying, not these words were explicitly said. And one way to see this is like in Mark, I mean, Jesus' preaching tour throughout Judea would have been, as William Lane Craig calls it, it would have been a whistle stop tour, you know, because he would have come into a town and like the Pharisees would have said like three sentences to him and he would have said three sentences, you know, in dialogue and then that's it, he's out of town, you know. Like, no, this is probably a summary of all that they said. This is probably, this is probably God's apostle summing it up for us. You know, this is this is a divinely inspired summary of what Jesus said. It's not necessarily Jesus' exact words, which would mean that, like, there's stuff Jesus said that wouldn't be in here, and so you might see another account tells it another way, and they could both be correct because there was probably a lot more said, but these are just the summaries, okay? And the the point that the author wants to make in, in which gospel you read will determine which things he thinks like need to be written down. But it doesn't mean that like they contradict necessarily. Okay, so anyway, so it says the Pharisees came to him to test him. And it's not like the Pharisee, you know, they, they probably had multiple debates about this with him. And this is kind of, he's summing up the outcome. This is the point they were making, you know, like, like in other words, like recently here in the United States, it's 
it's uh let's see the date today is november 5th uh 2018 and in the in the past few months we've had this like big uh news media event where this guy brett kavanaugh was put on the supreme court and he was accused of almost raping a woman when he was a teenager by this woman but he there wasn't good evidence for it and it, so eventually he got he got confirmed under the supreme court now i just told you that story and if someone else told you the story they would tell it differently because we're, we're both summing it up i'm not going to tell you exactly what was said every single time you know like brett kavanaugh like like and and, and christine blasey ford like their testimonies that day it was like eight or nine hours like no, I'm not going to go through every detail of that. You know, I'm going to sum it up. All right. So that gives you a point there. All right. So anyway, in verse four, uh, Jesus responds to the Pharisees and he says, Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they're no longer two but one flesh. All right, so Jesus is doing something that he, he doesn't often do. Instead of speaking from his own authority, he goes with, haven't you read? And it says, at the beginning, and he's going back to Genesis 1 and 2, beginning the Creator made them male and female. Yes, God made us two genders. And he says, and, and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. All right, and says, so then Je Jesus reasons from this. He uses reasoning and logic. He says, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, classic logical terminology, therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. So, and then the Pharisees say, well, you know, Moses uh, allowed, you know, why didn't Moses uh, command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Okay, so the uh, issue there is like the Old Testament law won't necessarily be exactly the way God wants it. God's coming to people in the Bronze Age who, if he would have just laid out his divinely perfect law, they wouldn't have understood it. It would have been meaningless to them. Like imagine if you went back to the Bronze Age and told and said like and tried to teach people how to live you know according to modern cultural human rights values they wouldn't understand it they wouldn't it would be meaningless to them they they, they would huh you know this is a time when fathers considered their sons and daughters their property and could kill them as they wished and it wasn't looked down on as bad this is a time when if i killed your slave then i had to give you a slave not i would be executed and that was normal, and have, that's Hammurabi's code, like, okay, so, like, you gotta understand, like, God's working with them, but he, as Jesus points out here, he puts stuff in the law so that if the, as they study it more carefully, it will transform their culture, and so he's saying, if you, yeah, Moses did allow for divorce, but if you study it more carefully, you'll understand that that's not really what God wants, okay, so, uh, it becomes a major basis for rational theology and that God has more stuff tucked away in there that maybe even the guy who wrote it didn't necessarily realize was explicitly in there. But this is divinely inspired uh, word of God through a human author. And so there can be stuff in there if you're careful with your reasoning. And so that's what Jesus is doing here. He's going back to Genesis and reasoning from Genesis to say that even though Moses allowed divorce, it's actually not what God wanted. And he's reasoning that from Genesis. Okay, so the important thing we want to understand is we want to do some reasoning here too. We want to do some careful reasoning. So let's look at this. And I ask teenagers this, and they never quite get this because the, the way the statement is is kind of the reverse of how you would say it in English, but it takes them a while. And so I always ask them this, and it takes them a while to get this. This is the exercise we do. It says, verse 5 says, well, verse 4. At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And I always say to the kids, I'm like, Okay, so why 
do people get married then? You know, because like, now it's like, like leaving your father and mother, being united to your wife, and then the two becoming one flesh is like loaded, it's, it's pregnant with meaning, right? Because that's like sexually, you literally join bodies. But also, out of that comes a human being, a baby, that is literally formed out of both your bodies. So you become one flesh. But also there's another sense in which two people who are married, if they can be close enough in how they... You can think of it like demon possession. <laughs> like, uh, maybe demon possession isn't a good... Think of it this way. If two spirits... If, if two... If, if two people have completely the same idea about everything and they agree about everything, then they're essentially like one spirit inhabiting two bodies. Maybe that's one way to to put it. Okay, so he's talking about marriage, but it's, it's kind of elaborating on what marriage means there. He's giving us a lot, actually, about marriage. But he says, At the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. For this reason, a man, uh, people will get married. And I always ask them, I'm like, well, why, do, why, look at that, you know, read those two verses, why is it that people get married? And they're like, so they can become one flesh, so they can have kids, so they can leave their father and mother, and they, they look at everything after the words, for this reason. But for this reason refers back to verse 4. It's it, at, God made them male and female, and that's why people get married. We get married, we get married, have sex, the whole nine yards. The reason why we do all of that is because we're male and female. That's what Jesus is saying here. So, like, homosexual marriage is not what God intended. Just like divorce is not what God intended. Just like all of that is not, not what God intended. Okay? So, there you go. It's not, it's, it, you know, Jesus gives this blanket statement that, like, the reason why we have sex, marriage, and, and all of that, and, and, and even having children is because we're male and female. It's because we're because God made us males and females. And it's clearly, you know, the two will become one flesh. I mean, it's clearly monogamous. And we do all of that because we're males and females, because we're a society of males and females. Okay. So, there you go. Jesus did talk about all of that. So anyway, uh, we keep reading, and it says, The disciples said to him, If this is the situation between a husband and wife, it is better not to marry. Jesus replied, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to him is, to whom had, it has been given. So here he actually gives us a little bit about the transgender thing. Because, I mean, obviously, we all know that there are people who are born, and they don't really fit into the male-female dichotomy. There are people like that who literally have both male and female genitalia from birth, and they will never be able to have children, and they just don't fit into that male or female thing. And then we could say, like, well, maybe, not today what we're saying is, like, those are, you know, if you look at someone, you know, basic genetics of, like, an XX chromosome for female and an XY chromosome for male, that's kind of either or. But there are secondary sexual characteristics, like how your brain develops, um other stuff like that it's a bit debatable but there may be some evidence that there are people who are should be in the neither male nor female category where it's not completely they're not you know they're not completely in one or the other that like we used to think they that they're you know so like you may have a guy who's has a brain that developed like a woman's brain but he has physically he's more like a man in other ways and he has XY chromosome but there may be some other stuff as far as his hormone levels and how he developed that make him more like a female and you say well okay there's good scientific empirical evidence that this person probably fits more in the neither male nor female camp and you've got to go with kinda of like the best approximation of where he she you know we don't have a good word for that person how that person fits in okay so uh Let's see what Jesus says. He says, in verse 12, well, we'll go to verse 11, because he's talking about uh, you, you get married, you got to stay married. And, and the disciples say, well, if that's the way it is between a husband and wife, it's better than just not to get married. 
And uh, Jesus says, he talked about not getting married then. So he says, uh, Jesus replies, Well, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom has, it has been given. For there are eunuchs. So a eunuch is a person who who usually is the guardian of like the queen or something, and he has had his ability to impregnate a woman uh, physically removed. He's been castrated. Okay. So, like a, like a hog or something. Okay, so uh, he says, for there are eunuchs. But he gives like three categories of eunuchs. There are eunuchs who were born that way. Eunuchs who were born that way, yeah. People who don't fit into that dichotomy by, from birth. Okay? And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. Yeah, we, we understand how that works. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of kingdom of heaven. So he gives, he's expanding the definition of eunuch. When we think of the word eunuch, we think of just that middle definition of people who've been snipped. But like, Jesus expands it out and he says there are eunuchs who were born that way. And there are some who have been made that way by others. And there are those who choose to live that way for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept it. So in other words, like, if you can accept marriage, you should get married. If you have that kind of love in your heart for that person, you should get married. If you can forsake marriage for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, you should do that. Because whatever ability God implanted in you is what you should be doing. It's what God intended for you. You look at your abilities, what you're good at, and that gives you an idea of how you were made and what you were made to do. So, like, um... My grandfather used to say, he would sometimes speak in farming uh, metaphors, and he would say, everybody has their own road to hoe. Was, he would say that. Because, you know, one person in life will be, things will be going fine, and, he, and he's, in other words, when you hoe a field, nobody does that anymore, but in old times, he actually plowed a field with a, with a mule. And he said his, grand, his daddy, not, not his granddaddy, his daddy, my great-granddaddy, uh, would always tell him, don't wear out the mule, and he would get really mad. He was just a teenager, and he'd get really mad about that. But then he would tell me, he said, you know, you can wear out the mule because people don't realize that, like, humans have more stamina than animals. Um, so, they, you know, people wear out their dogs, and Granddaddy would wear out the mule. So, uh, <laughs> but, like, uh, so it bothers me sometimes when I see people, like, I saw a guy, like, riding a bicycle and walking his dog. It's like, your, your dog doesn't have, like, 15, 30 minutes, like, yeah, that dog needs a break, buddy, okay? But, like, uh, it just bothers me sometimes. But anyway, uh, the, uh, the issue is, like, when you're hoeing a field, you're going in between the rows of the, of the planted crop, and you're, and you're taking the hoe and you're chopping up weeds. You're, you're, you're physically weeding the field. And so, there's going to be patches in your row where you might have more rocks, you might have thicker, more weeds, and the guy next to you might have easy going, almost no weeds in his spot. He's just walking along, he gets way ahead of you. But then, you know, later on down, the field is long and the rows are long, and later on down the line, yours might be easy going and his might be difficult. But the reality is, is like the only way we're going to get this whole field weeded is if Everybody takes a row and hoes it. So everybody has their own row to hoe in life. Like your life is not going to go exactly the same as everyone else's life, and that's just how it works, you know. But this is your path, and you've got to walk it. And this is your meaning. Your meaning and what's special about what you're going to do is going to be your row to hoe, you know. <laughs> so anyway, um, there we go. Now. The homosexuality question, there is something else I think that's important to say about this. The Bible never actually condemns what we today would call being a homosexual. In other words, we combine things that, that the Bible separates. A man being attracted to another man is never condemned in the Bible. A man having sex with another man is considered sinful. But having the desire to do so is not a sin. Okay? On top of that, the Bible talks a lot about adultery, but 
the desire that leads to adultery is not a sin. It's when, but actually having adultery is a sin. Now, there may be a line in there somewhere, but at the bottom line is like, you're not expected to never find another person sexually attractive, biblically, but you are expected to be faithful. Okay, so like, this is the issue that, that, that maybe you can blame it on Christianity because Christianity introduced mono uh, heterosexual monogamy into the culture. But it's not a sin to be gay. It's a sin to do gay. So I, there are people out there who, even though they they have same-sex attraction, they don't act on it. And in that case, with that person, here's what I want to say. And this is a hard time. People have a hard time accepting this, but like, when you think about it, it's like, isn't that person a hero? Shouldn't that person be invited to give speeches on overcoming temptation and doing better in following God. Shouldn't that person be telling everyone else how to follow God better? Because he's got a temptation like that. He must be doing pretty well. And so, me, as, as a heterosexual male, I just don't have that attraction. And so, oftentimes, when I, when I have a, a homosexual teenager, I'm like, I just don't know how to counsel this kid. I feel like anything I say is not really, I can't really understand what they're coping with. I'm not going to be dishonest with the kid about what the Bible says. I'm not going to hide what the Bible says so that I won't hurt their feelings. I'm not going to hide what I think. But I'm also not going to be the one to tell them how to deal with it. I think there's some room where we have to kind of not judge you know in other words like if that person's simply struggling with their homosexuality i'm just not going to judge that you know because like think about it this way let's say that you and your guy friends are sitting in the mcdonald's or wherever you go and the swedish bikini team walks through the door at that point you might struggle with your heterosexual desires and you might wear your heter your heterosexuality on your sleeve maybe it's a, it's difficult for you you might do some things that you're not super proud of but at the time you know whatever but let's say that like you just have that struggle all the other guys no one's going to necessarily look down on you too much for they're going to understand that you're having that struggle and you're dealing with it. Whereas, let's say that like you're a homosexual man and you just feel real tempted to kind of be more effeminate in how you speak or maybe uh, wear brighter colors and, you know, certain clothes that, you know, a woman would pick out which are really bright and flashy and, you know, wear a lot of gold rings on your finger and, you know, maybe you want to go take a dance class or, like, you know, uh, do some acting or modeling or something. Like, and do stuff that, like, honestly, you're just struggling, you know, th these are homosexual tendencies, you know, and, like, to some degree. I, it, not necessarily, they're not necessarily homosexual, but you get the idea, I think, that, like, they can be. And so, like, we have a tendency to just look down on that person and their struggle as just, it's already a sin that they're even struggling with their homosexuality. And that's my point. It's not a sin to have homosexual desires. And it's not, it's a sin to act on them. But the struggle between having them and acting on them we look down on those people and we judge those people in that struggle. Whereas if it's a heterosexual struggle, we almost think it's cool. We almost like, so like if, so I, I made a lot of videos about this. So like, uh, 
Like I'd seen men, you know, and like when a bunch of women walk in the room, they have to go talk to them, like even though they don't even know them or they barely know them. And it's like, that's absurd. That's ridiculous. To me, that that is ridiculous. That's as ridiculous as if you were going to go take ballet classes because you're struggling with your homosexuality. Because that's exactly what you're doing. You're struggling with your heterosexuality. Why are you talking to those girls? Because you, you find them sexually attractive. If a group of boys walked in the room who were overweight, it wouldn't matter if they were the, the top physicist in the world or rocket scientist or how important they were, you wouldn't want to talk to them because you don't want to have sex with them. So, like, this is my point. Like, I look at the young man who just can't help himself to go talk to the girls as struggling with his heterosexuality. I don't look down on him for that, but, like, my point is it's no different from the man who wants to go do male modeling. He's struggling with his heteros with his homosexuality. Those one, is, those are things that, like, as far as I can tell, you're just born with, and like, it's not a sin to you know have a, to be tempted to sin. You know, like at the at the end of the day, and that struggle is something that's common to all of us. And I'm not going to look down on this person because he has a struggle that I don't deal with. You know, you can think about it this way: Superman, you know, can fly to the other side of the universe at the speed of light, and so fast that he reverses time, and he can like battle someone in the center of the sun, and all this super stuff. You know, he has a super suit that he made with super weaving, so that. If, uh, you know, he ever loses his superpowers, it can still, like, stop bullets, and it'll just be like a hard punch. You know, and he has a supermobile that he made out of a super metal called Supermanium. And, uh, in the third Superman movie, Richard Pryor, Superman, uh, recommends him for a job. And so you can say, well, what, what references do you have, Richard Pryor? And he can say, super references. <laughs> they're super you know what I mean like so like Superman could go to the Olympics and just win every time and uh, and it would be who got the gold medal and everything this year oh Superman again okay well all right well it's just a battle for a second <laughs> He's first man on the moon everything you know so like Superman has the temptation you know like we'll just go right through it Superman 4 in Superman in, in the 1980s uh, we were using hydrogen bombs. So the nuclear bombs that were dropped on Japan were like firecrackers compared to the bombs that we developed later on. The hydrogen bomb uses, so in other words, the bombs we dropped on Japan were like uranium and plutonium bombs, where you take uranium and plutonium are elements of, on the periodic table that like have lots of protons and, and electrons and neutrons and if you split those atoms you get a lot of energy out whereas water is made of hydrogen and oxygen which have much less so they just hydrogen just has one proton and one electron so hydrogen you can't really split it but if you fuse it and force it and force it into two hydrogen atoms to become one helium atom then they'll have two protons and two electrons and so then you get way more energy out so when you take little atoms and smush them together you get energy out but it's like way more than when you split the big atoms so a fission bomb is when you split the big atoms and a, and a fusion bomb a hydrogen bomb is when you force the little atoms together so in a real sense like no country has ever used nuclear weapons. Uh, United States used nukes on Japan and Hiroshima, but like those nukes were firecrackers. So the way the nukes work now is you have a fission bomb that's set off to, in a very, 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 very short time, heat up water. And then that water is heat up, heated up so fast that fusion is caused, and then you get well, the biggest one we ever detonated, I think, if I remember the calculation right, is 3,557 times more powerful than the one we dropped on Japan. So, at that time, the way I understand it, in the 80s, 
the United States and Russia were in a very heated, very heated, ha ha, Cold War. And they were de both detonating hundreds of those bombs a year in tests just to show off, just to prove who's more powerful. And, you know, it got pre that's pretty scary. Now, in real life, they were taken down by Ronald Reagan, a professional movie actor, was now president. And he lied and said that we had space lasers. And Ronald Reagan teamed up with Margaret Thatcher, and they defeated communism. And it was largely because the Americans had space superiority, and we'd sent people to the moon. He lied saying we had space lasers where we could take out their nukes. And they fell for it. And there was a lot of economic pressure anyway. And uh, I don't know what Margaret Thatcher did, but everyone says it was like incredibly important. And it was the two of them. It was like a tag team. And they defeated communism. And it, none of it would have been possible without those monkeys that we, you know, sent into space. Like, so we should never forget the sacrifices that were made. Because it wouldn't have been possible to defeat communism. <laughs> so anyway, the uh, in Superman 4, though, it's not real. And Superman, a little kid in a school in, like, Idaho or somewhere is, like, really upset. And, like, like so there's, like, this, like, class of students and they're te they're like in like eighth grade and like their teacher is like so what do y'all think we can do nuclear war is so bad what do y'all think we can do and like the kids like i know what we can do we'll just ask superman to do something about the nuclear war and so the kid writes superman a letter and and he says you know can you just get all the nukes and throw them in the sun or whatever and so superman like goes before the the fortress of solitude computer that has like all of the intelligences of all of the Kryptonian smart guys are like stored in the computer and Superman's mom, but no longer his dad because back in Superman 2 he'd sacrificed the superpowers so he could marry Lois Lane. But then like uh, a bunch of evil Kryptonians broke out of the Phantom Zone interdimensional prison, so Superman had to sacrifice his dad's presence in the computer to get his superpowers back. And then he couldn't be married to Lois Lane anymore, so she was gonna, but she was real upset about that. But then like, uh, he gave her a super kiss that was so incredible that she forgot about it. And then she didn't remember who he was anymore. So that's what happened there. But anyway, uh, in Superman 4, Superman uh, decides... The Kryptonian High Command tells uh, Superman that, like, if, you know, the Earthlings, the, the humans could destroy... They built the nukes. They could destroy them on their own. And, like, all he's doing is making their decisions for them. And if they just give up their decision-making ability over over what they do over to someone else, then he's teaching them to not think for themselves, and he's teaching them to be betrayed. But Superman is persuaded by the little kid's letter and decides that, like, you know, Krypton is dead, and, you know, they could have been saved if they would have listened to his dad, and there was, those guys are a bunch of stuffy old, you know, uh, dumb guys, dummy dumbs. And, like, uh, so Superman... Goes and gets all the nukes. He makes a big net in space, and he he super gets all the nukes. And all the countries in the world are like, okay. He gets all the nukes, puts them in the net, and throws them in the sun. And so the first thing that happens is uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey and Jordan all invade Israel because, of course, the only reason they haven't done that is because uh, you know Superman. Well, because they have nukes, and those other countries don't have any nukes. But anyway, so like, um, anyway, we still have nukes. The uh, that's the issue I was bringing up. So maybe I've set the set this the the point. And so this is the point I'm trying to make about homosexuality. I'm not trying to call Superman gay, but I am saying that super, even though he wears, you know. If I saw a guy walking down the road wearing that, I'm hard think he was probably gay, you know. But like, <laughs> Superman faces temptations that I don't face, and so who am I to help him deal with those temptations? Who am I to counsel him on how he deals with those temptations? Seeing as how I don't have the ability to just end nuclear war because I decided to. Because I can fly faster than the speed of light. I just that's not something I can do. 
So, like, I can't, you know, so, and a lot of times they do this in the comic books, like Superman takes over the world and turns evil and has to be stopped by Batman, blah, blah, blah. Like, it, like, well, yeah, I don't face the temptation to just take over the world single-handedly. I don't, I, don't, I don't face that temptation. That's not really a temptation I have because I can't do that. I, I'll never will be able to do that. And so I don't face the temptation to have sex with another man because I can't. Not in my mind. Not in the part that matters. Because the physical touch, you know, that's, that doesn't mean anything. It's the mental part that's really the, where the sex really is. The physical just accompanies it. So, like, that's my point. Like, uh, I don't face that temptation that Superman faces. So, who am I to counsel Superman on how to deal with that temptation? I'm going to be honest with him. I'm going to tell him what I think and why I think it. But as far as, like, the psychology of, like, how he goes through coping with it, I can't. And so, that I think we, we need to be slower to judge people who are homosexuals. Because the way that they're coping with it, so like, let's say you're a teenage girl and maybe you experimented a little bit with kissing other girls. Like, I'm not going to come down on you as just this terrible person. I'm just not. I'm not. Uh, because, to me, that's no different than the girl sitting next to you who experimented, you know, maybe going even further with a boy. You know, where and neither one of those things they should have done, but they're coping with their their temptations and they're they're struggling to sort that out and parse that out. Um, the lesbian girl's probably not going to get pregnant, but that doesn't mean she can't get hurt, um, in especially in a big way. So, you know, there's that. I think that kind of covers the bases. And that's an hour and a half, but there we are. I hope everyone sleeps well tonight and uh, has a fantastic day tomorrow. Bye.